take our Bibles and turn to the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter number 5. If you remember, we were here last Sunday, but we're going to look at a different topic. Last Sunday we looked at in the Spirit, but I want to refer to some verses uh, in the early section of Galatians 5. Let's begin reading in verse number 6. And I really want to share a message with you on this morning about who hindered your race. Who's hindering your race? And I know that's not a Father's Day sermon, but I hope that God will use it to help each of us this morning. Galatians 5, verse number 6, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this Lord's Day and the opportunity that we have to come before you and God hopefully hear from your word and your voice. That's what we desire. Lord, not just to sit in a building and listen to a, a lesson or a, a topic, but Lord, to hear what you would speak to us today. And so I pray, God, that your spirit would guide us, that you would have your way, that every everyone present today, God, you would just uh, work in their heart and speak to them about their own walk with you. I ask God that you would also help me today, Lord, help me to be able to present your word in such a way that would uh, affect your people uh, in their walk with you, Lord, to help them to draw closer to you. And Lord, we'll give you glory for what you do, for it's in Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. The Bible often uses allegories, and uh, if you'll notice that when you read through the Scripture, an allegory is just an example to clarify a point. And the Apostle Paul uh, uses that extremely well as our Lord Jesus Christ did. And so here he's picturing the Christian life as a race running in a race. You might remember in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul uses one allegory after another. He said that we're to be good soldiers, endure hardness as good soldiers. And then he, te- he says that we're to be good athletes, trying to gain to win the prize. And then he goes from the athlete to the farmer. So he says you're a soldier, you're an athlete, and you're a farmer. And he's using all of that to try to help us to understand how am I to live in this world? What kind of what kind of Christian am I to be? How am I to how am I to progress and become what Christ wants me to be? And and so when he's working with the Galatian churches and Galatian believers, he reminds them of a time that they were doing extremely well in their Christian life. He said, you did run well. There was a time that you were excelling in this race. You were running well. But something happened. Instead of continuing on that road, running for Christ, developing, maturing, growing, becoming more Christ-like every day, now you stumble. You're not making any progress. You're laying on the ground and uh, you're not doing the things that Christ wants you to do. You're not developing. You're not growing. In fact, uh, some of you are actually going back in the wrong direction. You're not going in the direction of grace, but you're going in the direction of the law. You're not looking to Christ. You're looking to Moses. And so he was very earnest in this letter to try to jolt them back and get them up off the ground and going in the right direction for Christ again. I wonder if you would stop and by the help of God's Holy Spirit this morning looking at your own Christian walk and Christian race, I wonder how many of you could say with the Holy Spirit bearing witness, Brother Tommy, I'm running my race and I'm running well. 
I'm doing extremely well in my Christian walk. I'm developing like I should. I'm spending quality time with Christ. I'm concerned about the unsaved. I'm witnessing. Uh, there's a oneness between me and the Holy Spirit of God. And, and I, I believe I'm really walking in the light, being a witness and bearing witness to Christ by the way I'm living and by the words I speak. How many of you would raise your hand and say, Preacher, that's exactly, you don't have to raise them right now, but that's exactly where I'm at. I'm running well. Well, if you could say that, praise the Lord. And stay in tune with God. Keep doing what you're doing. But sadly, many of us would have to say, well, you know what, I've stumbled. I can look back and see a time that I was doing better for Christ than I'm doing now. I remember days when tears would roll down my face when I prayed. I remember times when God was so near to me, it felt like I could touch Him. And, and uh, it's been a long time since my Christian walk has been what it used to be in those days. And there's a reason for that. Something has hindered, or better, we should say, someone has hindered you from going on with Christ like you need to go on with Christ. Amen? There's a problem, but praise God there's an answer to the problem, right? Well, the first suspect that we have to look at when we think about Christians being hindered is Satan himself. And, I, I, and that you've heard that probably most of your Christian life. You've been warned about the devil, but I think sometimes we kind of put that back there and we don't really recognize that one of the problems I'm having, some of the difficulties I'm facing, the struggle that I'm in is because an enemy is attacking me, right? Usually when you think about a race like an Olympic race, you don't see too many times where the race is just completely stopped because of an outside influence like a terrorist attack or something, right? But if you're look, thinking about an Olympic race and a race being halted, uh, that would be the best picture. Satan just comes in and tries to destroy, right? He comes in to, to kill, to steal, and destroy. And I just want to remind you this morning that you have a real adversary that's constantly scheming and planning and working and preparing and he's looking for any opportunity he can get to attack you and to cause you not to continue to make development in your Christian life or halt you in your race. You have a real enemy. And he, he hates the fact that you belong to Christ and he's going to do all that he possibly can do to see that you are completely defeated. And you say, Brother Tommy, I thought Jesus conquered Christ, uh, Satan on the cross. He's a defeated foe. He's a defeated foe, which makes him even more dangerous. Right? Have you ever looked at some of these uh, Discovery Channels when the... When a lion or something is injured, they get more dangerous, right? When they're caught in a trap, you don't just walk up and pet them. I mean, that's when you have to be extremely cautious because they're already on guard, right? They're just wanting to lash out at anything. Satan has been dethroned. He has been defeated, but he's not in hell yet. He hasn't been assigned to his eternal prison yet, right? That means he's still very active. And if you don't believe that, just open up your Bible and see how many times that God refers to the enemy's effort in the church. Remember in Ephesians chapter number 6, uh, Sister Wilhelmina mentioned this this morning in Ephesians 6 and verse 11. Notice what Paul says as he's talking about putting on the whole armor of God, and again, that's an analogy, right? You can't go to the Christian bookstore and buy the helmet of salvation, right? Uh, the shield of faith. You can't pick that up at the Bible bookstore. That's your faith. It's supposed to be a shield against Satan's arrows that are, he's throwing out at you. And only your faith can quench the fiery darts of the enemy. Right? 
So how's your faith? How's your shield of faith? I hope it's a big shield. <laughs> Not this little. How would you like to go out to battle with this tiny little old shield and people are shooting arrows at you? So what do you need to do? You need to develop that faith, grow that faith, strengthen that faith. Amen? Because you have an enemy that's throwing fiery darts at you with every opportunity he can. But notice verse 11 of Ephesians chapter number 6. Put on the whole armor of God. Now why should I do that? Why would I walk, want to walk around every day with all the armor on? I mean the girl of truth, the legs protected, feet protected, chest protected, head protected, shield to cover areas that may not be covered, right? Why would I want to do that? Every day, put on the whole armor of God. Notice what he says, that you may be able to stand against all the wiles of the devil. You see, he's always strategizing. And I think you've probably forgotten about that. I mean, you're, you're living your Christian life. You're doing fairly well. You know, you're not out here in the world just wandering from God. So you're doing pretty good. But you're not running like you should run. You say, preacher, I'm on the track. Well, you're not getting anywhere. Right? And you, you need to wake up and realize you've got an enemy that doesn't want you to finish the course. You've got someone that's doing everything he can to keep you from running the race that God, God wants you to run. Isn't that true? And so you've got to stand against his strategies, his schemes. Another word for that wiles is his methods, his methods, right? And he has methods and means. Paul said, I'm not ignorant of Satan's devices. And I wonder if we sat down with Paul and, Paul and we said, Paul, list all those devices. And we had our list already written out. I wonder what would be on his list and what would be on our list. We'd say, well, we're not ignorant either. He said, well, look, at, my list is a whole lot longer list of devices than you have. And there's a lot that Satan can do, right? And, and we, we seem to kind of be asleep to the reality that we have an adversary, an enemy that's going to do everything he can to keep us from being the Christians that Christ purchased us to be with his own blood on the cross. And so, stand against the wiles of the devil. And this is such a familiar verse, almost as it's, it's difficult to quote it because the more you quote it, the more I think sometimes the apathetic we get to the truth of it, but Romans, I mean, 1 Peter 5, verse 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So Peter's writing to the Christians in Jerusalem, and he says, Now listen, you know how vicious a lion is, don't you? How a lion has just no heart at all, right? When, when a male lion is going to come in and take over a pride, one of the first things he does is he, he kills, just bites to death all the little ones of his own lion. I mean, you think, well, you'd leave lions alone with No, he comes in and, and bites the, kills everyone. He wants the uh, lady lion to come back in so he can have his own children. So to have his own, he destroys every other little cub that's there. That's cruel, right? Yeah. No, they're vicious. Yeah. And you've got some, someone who is vicious, who is cruel, yeah. doing everything he can, planning, working at it, trying to figure it out, how am I going to stop them from running the race? And here we are, acting as though we don't have an enemy in the world. Now, do you think we're going to run the race that we're supposed to run with that kind of attitude? What did he say? He said, be sober. Right? What does that mean? That means to be alert. How many of you are really just on, on guard, alert, 
that you've got an enemy trying to take you out. I mean, did you wake up this morning thinking, hey, I've got an enemy. I better watch out for my, that enemy today. I better look around every corner, be on guard, and be prepared because... Now, I hate horror movies. I, I, don't, I don't watch them. I hate them. <laughs> but when I was younger, and I used to watch them, you know how the, how the scenes go, right? Bom, 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 bom. You know just any second, right? And your heart starts pounding, and then all of a sudden, out of the dark comes this terrible-looking creature, and, oh, somebody's just attacked and destroyed! And the reality is, Satan is literally hiding around the next corner trying to do his best to set you up for a fall. And you just close your eyes and walk through the world whistling a tune as you have no care whatsoever. You better open your eyes up and get aware and be alert that you can't live the Christian life this way. If you're going to keep running like you ought to run, if we're going to run like we ought to run, if we're going to run like we used to run, We've got to come to the conclusion there are some people that are going to try to trip us up, some enemies that are going to try to trip us up, and I have to be ready to fight against his strategies. Are you trying to resist those strategies at all? Be sober, be alert, be vigilant, be always alert. You know why you've stumbled and you're laying on the track? It's because you gave up that vigilance. When you were a younger Christian and you knew it, I have to be in my Bible. I must. I can't miss time with God. This is essential for me. And you, you went so long reading and then you didn't feel like you were really being attacked much and so you quit reading as much as you used to read and you're still thinking, hey, I'm doing pretty well. They, I don't have any big problems and major problems and life is going pretty good for me and all the while you don't realize maybe Satan's backed off or, or, or is acting like he's backed off just to set you up for a final pounce. And so don't play the part of the fool. Us, we, have to, we would be insane to walk out on a battlefield somewhere without our best to protect our hearts, right? Think about a soldier today. Our weapons. Would you, go to, would you go out to war with no way to defend yourself whatsoever? None of us would. And yet we try to live this Christian life as though Satan is already in hell and he's not. Amen? So be sober, be vigilant. You know what the next verse says, verse 9? It says, Whom resist steadfast in the faith? Whom resist constantly, steadfast. Satan says, hey, you know, you don't have to do that. And you say, yes, I do. Satan said, why don't you go ahead and do this just one time? You say, no, I can't sin against God and do that. Satan said, why don't you just, you know, just miss this. You don't have to go to this, uh, this thing. It won't help you much. You say, no, I have to go. I must go. And I have to stay on guard and I have to constantly, every time he says a lie about God, I have to say, no, God does love me. He does care for me. He's in control of my life. He has never treated me wrong. Amen? He, listen, can I say something to all of us? God is so much, He is for you. He loves you. He is not the one attacking you or trying to give you a hard time or difficult time at all. He's not. Right now, God is doing the best thing for you that you need done in your life. And sometimes that's hard for us to believe, isn't it? Preacher, right now, God's doing the best thing for me in my life? Absolutely. Because He's a loving Heavenly Father. He is not a cruel Father, is He? He's a loving Father. And a loving Father, He is going to do His best to care for you as much as He can. Amen? So you have an enemy, and the first one we ought to be aware of is Satan, right? But, but you know what? 
in this story in Galatians, who was giving these Christians their most difficult time? Saints. Other Christians. Isn't that sad? Now, whether these were uh, saints that were pretending to be saints, right? Who really wasn't born again at all. Is that a big problem in our day? Beware of false teachers. Isn't that true? Amen. What did he say? In the last days, perilous times shall come. Men shall heed to themselves. Teachers having itching ears. He warns us over and over again about false teachers. Christ said, when I come back, there will be false Christ in the world. People even acting as though they're Jesus. And have you seen people do that? Can I ask you a question? Have you seen people flock to those? Yeah. And I'm saying to myself, how in the world could anyone ever believe something that, as insane as that? But boy, they've got some faithful followers, don't they? Amen. Where does that come from? That comes from the power of Satan to deceive a mind so much that they would believe things like that. And so sometimes it's from either imitating saints or from saints themselves. Now that's not good news. Is it? You know what? If you're running a race, if you're a runner in a race, you know what your number one danger falling is in that race? If it's not for your own physical inability, your number one thing you've got to watch out for, other runners. Amen. You see what happens a lot of times in the Christian life we get so fixated on what other Christians are doing, whether they're doing right or doing wrong, we get our eyes off of Jesus. And we even put it, well, listen, don't, you, now I want to be a good example. I want to be a Christ like man. I, I want that with all my heart. But if you put your faith and confidence in me, you're insane. I, I'm not someone. To look at. You need to keep your eyes on Jesus because let me tell you something. Jesus Christ will never fail you. And, I, and I'm sad to report this. I will. I will disappoint you. I will come short. I, 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 I just will not do sometimes maybe what you expected me to do. Not out of malice or uh, an evil heart, but I, I just mess up sometimes and I'm a mess myself and I'm not the one to put your faith in. Jesus is the only one to put your faith in. Listen, if I ruin my life, I, I don't want you to ruin your life because I ruin my life. But let me tell you something, that's happening yes, is. everywhere. My God. Isn't it? You see, we're looking at Christians and we, and what, those that say they're Christians and we think, man, those people are doing so well. Why don't we just do what they're doing? Right? They must be doing something right. Now listen, have you been tempted with that thought or not? Have you ever watched this guy on TV in Houston? I mean, he's packed out a big old stadium. Right? Isn't that true? And you're looking at that massive audience and you think, we need to do something different. <laughs> right? Or you look at some other big churches and you think, what are they doing? Well, they, they're having uh, kind of like rock music and they're covering up the windows and putting strobe lights on and you say, well, you know, maybe we should give that a shot. And here are people in the church of Galatia saying, hey, you know, there's a better way to live a Christian life. If you really want to be holy, you've got to keep the law as well. You don't want to be an unlawful Christian. Could you imagine some of their arguments? And boy, they were being fooled away, weren't they? Isn't that true? You see, we, we have to stick to the truth. And sometimes, wanting to get along with other Christians, you're called to compromise. Now, I don't mind compromising like we said in Sunday school, color the carpet, don't bother me. Right? There, there's some things I don't care about. If you want to do it, you want to, you know, paint the bus, not pink, but blue or green or anything else, 
I might stand up if y'all want to paint me. <laughs> it, I don't care. But to start tra changing and transforming the church and saying, hey, we don't need Jesus. We can figure it out without Him. All we need is a better musician and better music or more money or a, or a message eating, a message that says, you're wonderful people. God bless you. You'll have no problems whatsoever. And if you keep coming here, you're going to get rich, filthy rich, and have no physical problems whatsoever. And then you go home and you face difficulties and cancer and problems and you say, well, I thought being a Christian you weren't supposed to face any of that. What happened? And you're going to come closer to losing your faith in a situation like that, right? Amen. Because the truth is, I don't care who you are, you're going to have some problems once in a while. <laughs> for, you, for you who couldn't see it, I raised my foot up that's broke right now. You're going to have problems. Difficulties. And what do we do in this situation? We say, praise God, because He's doing something. I don't know what He's doing, but I know He's working on my behalf for His glory. No matter what we face, that's true, isn't it? Amen? Amen. So sometimes you've got to watch out for other believers as well. Just because other people are doing it doesn't make it right. So where are we going to go to find out what's right? What, what's the source of our truth? Right? And you know what the Bible says about things like we just talked about? Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, perfect will of God. In other words, don't become like the world to win the world. Become like Christ to win the world. Isn't that true? We don't... We don't we don't become like them to gain them. That don't help them. It's not going to help an alcoholic if I start drinking beer. It's not. He's going to, you know what he's going to say? He's going to say, well, you know, if that guy's going to heaven, he's drinking, what's wrong with me drinking? So be careful that you are not enticed by these big things we need to just get our eyes on. I promise you, if we all work together for the glory of God, there's no telling what God could do here. And He would get great glory out of it. But we got to realize, hey, we're doing one or two things ourselves, aren't we? We're either being stepping stones, right? We're helping people. Remember, there was a race and... Uh, in the, the last Olympics and a lady tripped and fell right in front of one of the competitors and tripped, tripped her up. And she took the time to pick that one who tripped her. Picked her up. And in tripping herself, she got injured. And she was running and, and it sprang her ankle and she, she fell again. And the other one helped her up. When they crossed the finish line, they finally embraced each other, Right? In other words, we're all on a race, right? We may trip and fall, but we've got to be mindful that we've got to pick each other up. We, we have to encourage one another. We have to love one another. We must support one another. We must encourage one another. Amen? If we want to be the people God can use, we've got to stop thinking so much about myself and what I want and we've got to start thinking about others. Now, we can all come up with excuses to stay home, right? Amen. Any Sunday that comes, I promise you, any one of us could find a real good reason to stay at church, uh, stay home, and not go to church, right? Amen. I can give you a number myself. But it's not going to help you if I stay home. It's not going to encourage your faith if I stay home. I hope when I come, it encourages you a little bit. Can I say something? You have the same effect on everybody else in this building. When you come, you, you tell them, good job, way to go, keep it up. Praise the Lord. We can do it. Keep going. The finish line's right around the corner. We're going to make it. And 
Isn't that true? Or you're running that race and you see people who just kind of sit down on the sideline and quit and you're wore out yourself and tired and hurting and you say, you know what, others are quitting. I might as well quit myself. Do you think that happens once in a while? I guarantee you it happens. That when you see others quit, the Satan whisper in your ear, well, why do you keep going? And ain't nobody else interested in it. Anybody ever hear those kind of words? Yeah. And guess what's going to happen if you quit? You're going to encourage others to quit, right? So we've got Satan. We've got saints. Can I say something else? You also got yourself that sometimes... Right? They said there was ten rules. Ten things you should never do if you're going to run in a race. Don't ever do this if you're running in a race. Ignore pain. I couldn't help but think, you know, there's a lot of Christians, they're really hurting, they're suffering. You know what they're doing about their hurt and their suffering? Nothing. Not a single thing in the world. Inside, they're hurting, they're in pain, and they just keep, keep going like there's no problem whatsoever. I promise you, if you keep doing that, you are going to stop running the race sooner or later. You know what you ought to do with a broken heart and hurting and, and questions and misery and, and, and whatever it is that you're dealing with on the inside? You know what you ought to do with that? Take it to God in prayer. Don't just say, Lord, please help me. I mean, get in an altar somewhere. Get beside your bed. Pour out your heart to God. Let the tears flow again. Say, God, help me. Help me. You have not because you ask not. You say, preacher, I've asked and asked and asked. Ask again. You never, never are we taught in the Bible to stop asking, right? Get that burden to Jesus. Jesus can help you. But if you keep ignoring the pain, it's going to build up until you can't run at all. Well, they said, secondly, skip your warm-up. You ever seen people do that? They go to an athletic event. Maybe they run a little bit late, and so they just jump out there. And what happens when they jump out there without warming up? They start cramping up, or they tear hamstrings. Something goes bad wrong, right? Can I tell you where you warm up at? The house of God. Hey, that's really what church is about, right? We can't help you much more than say, hey, bend that, bend that muscle a little bit. Lift, lift that up some. Here, let me stretch you a little bit over here, right? But you skip the warm up over and over again, you're going to hit yourself. You won't even be able to run. I, I wrote the name down, but I can't recall it right now. But you remember the race, and, uh, and the young man was running, and he and he was doing really well, and then he tore his hamstring. How many of you remember this? And he got up, and he was trying to hobble to the finish line, and somebody got out of the stand ran onto the track field and put their arm around him and started helping him down the track. People, He had to get past the security people and everything. And he, it was a father who came on the track to help his son get across the finish line. People would come out there and the father would wave them off. I got him. I got him. We'll make it. We'll make it. And I, can't, I don't know if he skipped warm-up or not. But you can't do that. You can't. This morning in our Sunday school class, we looked at Ephesians 4, and I challenge every one of you, Ephesians 4 says, you supply every need I have, and I help you with the needs that you have, and each one of us. And without us helping you, you're going to be deficient. You need church, amen? Amen. Some of them run before eating breakfast. What do you think that means? There's a lot of Christians who don't pick up their Bible on, until they come to church on Sunday morning. That's it. 
The only time they pick up the Word of God is when they come to church on Sunday morning. You are not going to be able to make it if you don't spend time in the Holy Scripture, spend time reading the Word of God, listen, memorizing passages of Scripture. I mean, trying your best to retain what it was that you read. Not just reading it to say, well, I read it, preachers harp on it, and I read it. I'm done with it. That's not going to feed your soul. That's not going to give you the nutrients you need to get out of here and run like we need to run, is it? Remember, that there's ten things. That's just number three. <laughs> Let me give you one more and I'll quit here. They expect a personal record every race. Every new race, they think, I should, be, I should have beat, beat that by another second. I, should, I mean, I should have beat my last time. I should have done better. I should have done better. I should have done better. And you know what? So many Christians are just infected with that. They keep looking at what they do and they can't see what Christ is doing at all. They can't. They keep looking at themselves and measuring themselves by themselves or measuring themselves by other Christians. It's not about your personal best. It's about the grace that God gives you that day. It is. I wonder who hindered you. You know, the good thing is you can get back up. Amen? Amen. I was telling Brother Phil this morning, I wish I had the, this video for you. It was, it was a, a college champion, Big Ten championship. And it was a, ladies were running. And this lady was out front, out in front. And the one right behind her tripped her up and she fell. And you know what she did? She didn't just sit there. She got right back up. She started running again. And she won the race. She won the race. She was tripped up, fell. Most time you're going to come in last, right? She got back up. She poured it on and she won the race. You say, Preacher, I've, I've stumbled. I've fallen. Well, if you get back up and run... You can win. Amen? Amen? Just stay steady. Keep going. You don't have to run much further, do you? Isn't that true for most of us? We don't have far to go. We can see the finish line. It's just right out there. Why should we stop now? Amen? <laughs> you can sprint through, right? Sprint on across the finish line. Do well. Show everybody else how to live the last mile of the way. Amen? God wants to do that for you. But listen to me, you've got to come and do some business with Him. Amen? Amen? You can't keep just listening to sermon after sermon after sermon and not responding to Jesus and think you're going to run this race like you need to. Amen? Amen. You need to lay that pride behind. Come kneel in an altar and say, Lord, I need your help. Satan is beating me up. I've been distracted by others. Myself, Lord, I'm not doing well. And I want to get back to where I can run this race in a way that you get the glory. I want to run the race and you look again at me and say, you're doing well. You're running well. That will please God. Amen? Amen? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, I love you. I thank you for your love for us.